And here we go. Okay, perfect. So everyone, this is one of our final spring branch impact calls. And this calls all about professionalism and confidence as a vector manager. One of the things I'm excited about for this call particularly is giving you all just some things to think about as it pertains to being a strong vector manager. I think we can all agree when we look at our first vector managers that we had, you probably see a lot of confidence within them. You probably feel like you know they were our guiding lights through our vector journey. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this call who want to emulate their vector manager. And that's really great. Um, some of our panelists are going to talk about how they would emulate their DVM, but a lot of it also comes from your own self, being confident in who you are, being professional, holding people to high office standards, and that's really what we're going to talk about today, is just what it means to be confident as a vector manager, how to gain confidence if you don't feel like you're super confident right now, what it means to be professional, how to maintain a professional environment yet still friendly and fun, and that's going to be a really great call. Before we dive into the actual content of today's message, I do want to just go over quick housekeeping items. So the first thing that I want to mention here is our final spring call is on, we've got two, we've got two more calls. One is like our, our final official call and then one is a bonus call. So on April 16th at 4 p.m., we have promotions within the office. So that's gonna talk all about how to do event promotions, how to set up your office so that your walls do the talking for you. How do you people really excited about the vector opportunity, not just from the income standpoint, but from the experience standpoint? Um, we're gonna have some guest speakers on that. It's gonna be a really, really great call. And then the next day, uh, we're gonna have another workshop with John Wasserman, the DVM from the Powerhouse Division in the Northeast. So if you were on the PDI scenario workshop, it's going to be very similar to that, but for PCs. So PCs, PSPs, you know, that one-on-one, -on -one, face-to-face meeting with your reps is something that you feel like you definitely want to do a lot of this summer, which newsflash you should be doing a lot of this summer. This is a great call for you to jump on. Um, so the 416 at 4 p.m. is the promotions within the office, and 417 is actually at 10 a.m. So I'll be posting all the details of those two calls coming up this week. And then the last thing to, to know about just some of the housekeeping items is once the summer starts, guys, uh, the calls are going to move to weekly at 9 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. Now, I understand that not everyone's going to be able to make those calls. You might have interviews. You might have DVM calls. You might have region calls. That's fine. They're going to be recorded. They're going to be posted within 24 hours, the same way all of our car calls are. And they're going to be able to be watched on off hours, whatever it might be. But just know that we're going to be upping the number of calls to once a week at 9 a.m. And I guess the last thing I wanted to mention, I keep on adding things on here, but it's important. Uh, starting on April 30th, which is a Wednesday, I will be having, or no, sorry, May 1st, I think it is. May 1st, I'll be having open office hours. What that means is that every single Wednesday this summer, from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., I have open office hours. You will find the Zoom link in the Branch Impact group. Now, I know there are some people on this call who are not in the Branch Impact group because you're not part of the Northeast, Midwest, or Eastern region. That does not mean you can't jump on the uh, open office hours. It just means you have to get a little bit creative as to how you find the Zoom ID. Um, the open office hours are similar to roundtable discussions or similar to office hours that you would have at your college. You don't have to be on the full three hours. You don't have to let me know ahead of time. You just jump on. You can have a five-minute question, a 10-minute question, a 20-minute question. It doesn't matter. You just jump on. I will be there to help you out, guide you, answer questions, coach you, whatever you need. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that. It is new for this year, um, and we're going to see how it goes. And then the last thing that I want to mention um, before we jump into the content of tonight's call is some hot news. So many of you might have seen that in the Branch Impact page, I posted a question of who has some hot news, and I want to go through it because those who responded, super, super, super excited for all of you. And I don't want anyone to feel shy about sharing hot news. Hot news can be really big things or it can be small things. Did you just lock down your office space? Great. Did you just find some free furniture online? Awesome. Did you just sign 13 people in a one day's worth of recruiting? Amazing. Don't feel bad about posting 
things because you think that it might not be as exciting. I want to see all the hot news because it just helps everyone get excited for one another. So Everett Burns got five applicants yesterday for social media and recruiting assistant positions because of Miranda McAllister's post. So what I love about that right there is the fact that Everett and Miranda are collaborating and working together to get social media assistance. So Miranda actually posted a screenshot of her post on this thread. So if you're looking for social media assistance, uh, recruiting assistance, go ahead, steal that post. It's worked for Everett. It's worked for Miranda. You might as well take advantage of it. Brendan Slocum, he carded at one of his major schools yesterday and he got 20 touches. He has nine people set for interviews. His office is fully furnished and he just wishes school could end a little bit faster. <laughs> um, Charlie Bates has her first set for launch, which she actually updated me uh, during the beginning of this call, letting me know that she's got three set for her first launch, which will be at the end of April. She's got a goal of 25 set. That's huge. Uh, Miranda McAllister locked down her living situation for the summer, free rent. If you could just teach us all how to do that. You know, I'd like to have free rent at this place right here. Um, that would be great. Don Bergio closed out a 5K week yesterday in personal sales. I love the fact that he's still pushing for personal sales. The Northeast is a region that gets out a little bit later. Most of the branches in the Northeast don't open till May week two or May week three. So doing those personal sales now while you still can is really valuable. Nicholas Del Toro Torrente passed out 2,000 cards at GMU. Sat down to have a conversation with a student, student who thought it was a pyramid scheme. I'm assuming that you had a positive conversation about that um, and also ran into some past reps on campus as well. And then Patrick Woodring just got an agreement on his top office prospect. It's amazing, seven minutes from the divisional conference and the macaroni grill is right next door. <laughs> All really positive things. Super excited for everyone who updated us with hot news. As you can see guys, summer is here. It's really starting very quickly. I love to see some exciting things, even if it's just the fact that your office is next to Macaroni Grill. Now with that being said, I wanna go ahead and introduce our panelists today. Now you've heard before from Miranda McAllister. Miranda was a top branch manager down in the Eastern region. You know her story, you know her stats. Uh, she's going senior branch this year. She's super fired up about her goals and and competing on a national level once again. She was a trip winner to Grand Cayman. I know all three of our panelists were trip winners, so they can you know, maybe talk about that too. Uh, but I know she's gunning for Paris for this upcoming year. Then you've heard from Everett Burns before. Everett is, was a top branch, the top branch in the Northeast region this past summer. He developed a rep who hit over $60,000 her first summer. He's competing once again for a top national spot. Uh, senior branch as well, Grand Cayman winner, going for Paris. And then finally, our final panelist is Colton Horn. We have not yet heard from Colton Horn. He's actually from the central region. He ran an office last summer in Evanston, Illinois. He's running that same office once again. I had the privilege of visiting his summer last summer and visiting, visiting his office last summer. And the energy that he had in his team was powerful. And it didn't surprise me one bit that he had such an awesome office selling over $200,000. And I know Colton is really, really, really shooting for some big numbers this summer. The biggest I've heard out of a senior branch yet. So that is very exciting, very motivating. And without further ado, I do wanna jump into our first question. Now the first question, guys, and we're going to start out with Colton, and then we're going to go to Everett, and then we're going to go to Miranda. Just don't forget to unmute yourself since I didn't mute everybody on the call. So first question for everybody, what is your definition of confidence as a vector manager? Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you guys so much for being on the call. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, one of the things that I'd love to kind of touch back on that Shelby mentioned earlier is how we all have great role models uh, in our DMs and DVMs that we were kind of developed by. Uh, and one of the things that I think is so cool about branching is that we have an opportunity to both use them as role models that we can um, be guided by and also fuse that with our own personality and make it our genuine natural style too. Um, so I think that's like a really cool thing about the branch opportunity. Going back to the question though about what I think confidence means, um, for me, I think it really has to do with the, the kinds of thoughts that go through your head and how you allow them to affect you. 
right? So are you thinking about things that make you feel good about yourself, make you feel good about your team, your company, and things like that? Uh, and then how do you think that rubs off on others? So that's how I see confidence. Um, for me, I think I've been really fortunate to be developed by Danny Lewis, who's our DVM. Uh, and one of the things that I love about Danny is that he's constantly thinking, talking, and acting positively. Um, and if you know Danny, you definitely attest to that too. And when I was a sales rep in his office, I remember that I got more confident after every time I talked to him because he would be looking to build me up and make me feel good about myself. And so that's where I think it's so important to be humble as well. Um, because if you're constantly searching for compliments to make yourself appear a certain way to others, then you're kind of bordering on arrogance. But if you can always look to say thank you and give credit to others uh, and have the courage to really apologize uh, or admit when you're wrong, then your relationships in and out of the business are going to be so enhanced. Um, so I really believe that confidence and humility definitely go hand in hand. Yeah, I love the fact that you also mentioned how Danny poured into you to make you feel more confident. And that, in turn, probably helped you think of Danny as someone who was very confident, too. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And one of those things, confidence is energy. It's energy that transfers. You know, how you appear when you appear confident will help other people feel confident in themselves. It's the same way when you're around a friend who's really positive and like they're laughing and they're having a great time. You can't help but feel that same way right alongside them. So that's the same thing with confidence too. So Everett, same question. What is your definition of confidence as a vector manager? For me, uh, the way I knew I was going to be really confident going into the summer was just knowing I was the most prepared person in the room. Like I, if I was going to not have the summer I wanted, it wasn't going to be because I didn't know what I was doing. Like I was always going to be the, the most prepared person in the room. And Another thing is, uh, like Colton said, like letting how you talk to yourself affect you, especially in interviews, I think is the biggest thing. It's like uh, confidence in an interview is so much about them knowing that they're working to get the position. When they feel that, like when you're pouring into them, making them feel like they can do it, but at the same time you pull back and still challenge them, that's a sign of confidence as well during your interviews. That's how they're going to be so effective. And I think the way Colton described it's great. Um, but yeah, I think that being super prepared is important. Uh, knowing your scripts, you don't want to be looking down because you don't feel good about what you're saying when you're looking down. You're worried about what to say next. You're not worried about how you're saying it or just being you while you say it. And your scripts are going to sound so great when you know them versus read them. And that's where your confidence comes in for me um, with being prepared. Yeah, that's a great point, Everett. And I do want to mention that for some of you, you might not have your scripts memorized. I didn't have my interview script memorized going into my first summer, but when you spend your first week in the office literally running 12 interviews, chances are by the second week open, you're going to have your interview script pretty much memorized. So don't panic now and be like, oh my God, I don't have it memorized. Keep on working on it until you open up your office, but realize that first week you're running tons and tons of interviews, you will end up memorizing your script. With training, there's so many details of training. There's a reason why we have you script out training, so that way you do have things in front of you. There are parts of training where you can go off and tell stories and you don't have to have that scripted. Um, but Everett's absolutely right. When you do finally get everything you know, down to a point where you don't have to look at your notes the entire time, it's the same way you felt when you did your first demo and you didn't have to look at your, your uh, manual. You know, It's important to follow the manual, but when you got to that point after your you know, maybe 15th demo where you realized you did the whole thing without your manual, you're like, damn, I crushed that going to feel the same way for your interview. I also love, Everett, how you mentioned that confidence in an interview, yes, it's making the person feel good that they can do it, but it's also making them work for the job. Because if you are trying to convince, convince, convince the entire time, that, that energy that comes off of you is almost like you need that person to survive or to thrive, when in reality, you don't. So, being confident in the interview is standing in your own, knowing what you stand for, knowing what you are offering, and being okay with people not taking it if for whatever reason they're just, you know, not all about it. Now, if there's somebody who's like all about it but is hesitant, that's a different story. But if there's someone who's just being a jerk, you don't need to try to convince them to stick around. Cool? All right, Miranda, let's hear your response to the question. 
Hello. Hi, Everett. Hi, Colton. Um, haven't seen you guys since came in. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, thank you guys so much for being on the call. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on here. Um, so confidence was actually something I really struggled with, to be completely honest. Um, going into the summer, I didn't really have much confidence in myself, especially because I, being a female, there's not a lot of female influences in my region, especially. So that was something I was definitely not my strong suit but as the summer went on it was it just gradually grew because like totally whatever it and Colton said and um as I started to do well and my DVM started pouring into me more my confidence just naturally grew um and like when people were looking to me for guidance that just naturally boosted my confidence because I was an influence on people and that makes me really happy and the fact that people were looking to me and they're asking me questions just naturally boosted my confidence as the summer went on. Yeah, that's really great. I love that, Miranda. And I love that you, you know, thank you for the honesty. I thank you for just admitting that in the beginning, you weren't really feeling that confident, but knowing that you went through the journey and that you kept working at it and you kept showing up every day and not being scared, it naturally allowed you to build that confidence. So for those of you on this call who maybe feel like, oh, I'm really not there just yet, trust the fact that you will get there more naturally when you're actually running your office. Another thing that's important to recognize about confidence is the reason why we're talking about it, the reason why it's important um, to start out with is because, and I've mentioned this a few times at different division meetings that I've spoke at, but you will encounter reps who have very little confidence. I feel safe in saying that the majority of branch managers have confidence, otherwise they wouldn't have made it this far but you will encounter reps who have very, very little confidence and they need to borrow your confidence in them for a little bit and so they can build their own confidence. And that's one of the beautiful things about being a branch manager is being able to pour into other people and give them that confidence. I remember I had a girl who on day three of training back when I was doing three days of training, before she left, she just broke down in tears because she was so nervous. So nervous and for me I didn't quite understand it because that was not how I was when I first launched but this girl was just she's never talked in front of people before she was very quiet and reserved and I just sat with her and I poured into her and she went off and sold a galley set now she quit three days later but she was like I'm, I can't believe that I did that like I'm so proud of myself and ultimately the job wasn't for her but that was one of those moments I can look back on and be like wow I really was able to pour into someone so just so you're gonna have that opportunity to do that too Okay, Colton, I want to go to you now. Um, so you just talked about the importance of being humble. You kind, of, you kind of mentioned it, but didn't dive too deep on it. Can you dive a little deeper on what humility is and what it is not and how to maintain humility, but also appear strong and focused? Yeah, totally. Um, so first of all, in terms of what humility is not, um, I don't think humility has anything to do with like putting yourself down or coming off as weak or passive. I think that's almost the opposite. Um, in my opinion, humility makes somebody look and feel strong, right? Humility makes you strong. Um, and I can tell when someone has true confidence because everything they do is to prove something to themselves, right? It's way more important to prove something to yourself than to try to prove anything to anyone else. Um, somebody who's humble also, I think, has a really authentic understanding of what their natural tendencies are and like how their personality works and they can be really honest about it. So that way they can actually work really well with others, right? So it's important to recognize, especially because in branching, um, you're going to be working with a wide variety of personalities. So I think it's really important to be humble enough to realize like, okay, this is one of my strengths. This might be one of my natural tendencies that I don't like so much. So that way you can have a lot of control over it and work well with every type of rep or person. Um, also people that are humble don't need to, put other people down to lift them up, right? People that are humble uh, and confident can, can lift themselves up by lifting others up too. And I think that's one of the things that's really, really important. Um, people that are humble understand that they can't do anything alone, right? So human, human beings naturally are interdependent creatures. We rely on so many others. And in the business, it's no different. Like we know that as a branch or even as a rep, we rely on, I think about who do we rely on, right? It's customers. It's other people on our team when we were a rep, and now that we're a manager, it's our sales reps, it's our assistant managers, it's the district or, or division manager that developed us, and then it's other managers and other people in the region that we look to for guidance. 
So there's so many people that we look to for help and that we rely on. And, and being humble means always recognizing that and that we don't, we don't and we can't do anything alone. Um, so yeah, and then I'll just say like the final thing about uh, humility for me is um, going back to Danny Lewis, one of the quotes that he always says um, is don't get the big head, right? And, and I think that I've always kind of taken that to heart is like even when you start and hopefully you do start to experience some real like tangible success in the business, um, it's really important to not get the big head, right? And realize where you came from, where you're going and always look to serve others, right? Because that's the name of the game is we're a people first business and we're not looking for people to join our team to serve us and our goals. We're looking for, for people to join our team so that we can serve them and their goals. Yeah, that was great, Colton. Lots of, yeah, I'm really nice to you going like this. Yeah, 100%. Th those were some really great nuggets. I love what you said about, you know, humility is proving something to yourself, not to anyone else. I also love the idea of don't get a big head. Um, one of the things about getting a big head oftentimes is it actually takes you away from what's most important. And it makes you focus so much on your image rather than your actions. And then it's funny how people with big heads tend to actually just be all, all facade and, and not actually the depth that we're looking for. So those are really phenomenal answers, Colton. Thank you so much. Everett, moving on to you. So uh, was there anything that you did specifically each day to pump yourself up? Like what were some of the things that you would do during the interview and training to appear strong and confident? Um, I think it's kind of the little things sometimes. Uh, like uh, if you've ever gone on Vector Connect and listened to interview warm up speech by Trey Ketchum, it's like three minutes long, but I listen to it before interviews all the time and it gets me super fired up. If you've ever listened to Trey, he gets pretty fired up, but it's, it's just like a little way that I like to get excited for interviews, especially sometimes like I remember I had one interview in my schedule that wasn't the interview I was ever most excited about, but sometimes it was a really big interview. And so I would need to get myself readjusted to it after a long day of training. So I listened to Trey's uh, warm up song, chug a bottle of water. And it's like just something small like that can be good. But I also think like being dressed nice um, plays a strong role. And uh, when you look really good, you feel really good. And you always want to be the best dressed person in the room. And also stand up tall, like look people in the eye, um, use their first name. And I never realized the importance of using your first and last name, not just your first name. When you introduce yourself to people, like you're the manager and the manager is going to introduce themselves with the first and the last name. So I think that is, that goes a long way to firm handshake. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know for me, I have a few outfits in my closet that I call my power outfits. And they're like the outfits that I put on and I'm like, all right, today is going to be a day. Like I'm going to, I'm going to take control of this day. And if you don't have those outfits, I highly recommend investing in them because they, it's so crazy how, you know, we don't want to focus on outward appearance, but sometimes just having that professional appearance right from the start, just it, it elevates your confidence. Even if you don't have the confidence inside you can at least look in the mirror and be like, okay, I look, I look really professional today. I look really great. Um, and for females, if you want any suggestions as to places you can go um, to get some of these power outfits, I'm happy to share my favorite shops with you and just some of the things I do to, to dress professionally. Um, and everyone else loves like the idea of the firm handshake and the eye contact. Uh, just make sure, guys, you don't have like a slimy fish handshake. My, my doctor has that and it freaks me out every time I shake his hand. So firm handshake. Um, you know, not too close, not too far, but practice that with their DVM. They'll help you out. All right, Miranda, question for you. Now you mentioned a little bit during your first response that you weren't really confident in the beginning of the summer and that you grew in confidence. So how are you showing up differently this summer as a senior branch, as opposed to last summer? What are some of the core beliefs that you hold that help you really step into your most confident self? You know, what kind of advice would you give to a first year branch manager who maybe isn't super confident right now? Yeah, so um, the main thing for me is that I just have so much confidence in the opportunity, and that just kind of overflows into the confidence in myself. Um, I've done some coaching with Sam Latrico a little bit, and um, we've just kind of talked about this is the best opportunity out there for college students, hands down. And as soon as you really recognize that and believe that and know that, it'll just automatically transform into confidence in yourself um, and another thing uh, this is something that Shelby and I actually talked about in one of our coaching calls um, is that 
female leadership qualities actually make me a great leader. And there's actually more qualities that are feminine traits that make great leaders, to name a few. Networking, team building, supporting, consulting, rewarding, and inspiring others. And I feel like recognizing that, that recognizing my strengths and knowing that going into this summer, I have that natural nurturing ability as a female. And that's actually a, an advantage, not a disadvantage. So recognizing that and just living in those more and just having confidence and opportunity. Yeah. And I actually asked Miranda to bring that up in her response. And the reason being, so the qualities that you just described are considered feminine qualities. Now I'm going to kind of divert and go into that just for a brief moment. When I say feminine qualities, I don't necessarily mean female. Females have feminine and masculine qualities. Men have feminine and masculine qualities. Just the difference between the two is one is a softer quality, the other one's a harder quality. And that's why typically, you know, they're called feminine or masculine. They really don't have to be called either or, but the feminine qualities typically do show up more prominently in females. The masculine qualities typically do show up more prominently in males. But again, males and females can have both of those qualities. Now, the topic that Miranda and I discussed in our coaching call was surrounding the idea of gaining respect as a female manager. And at all the different uh, kickoff conferences that I've gone to, I always receive the same question. Shelby, how do I gain respect as a female manager? And I think that question is wrong. The question is not how do I gain respect as a female manager, it's how do I gain respect as a professional? Because the minute that you ask the question of how do I gain respect as a female manager, you're making the assumption that by being female, you don't automatically deserve respect, which is false. You do automatically deserve respect because you are a professional. Now, here's something that might help you realize that you deserve respect, and this is just specifically to the females. Feminine qualities are qualities that are more apparent in leaders. And this is something that's gonna help the males too because you don't have to be super macho. You can also be a little bit more in your like nurturing side. So there are qualities like nurturing, like mentoring, like empathy that are really, really valuable as leaders and do not need to be masked. So for the females out there, don't feel like being a female just because you don't see many females in Vector does not mean there aren't a lot of female leaders and does not mean that you can't be the best leader possible. So I just wanted to make that quick note there. So thank you, Miranda, for, for bringing that up. I really appreciate that. So the next question is gonna be on a rapid fire question. We'll have Everett start, then go to close, and then Miranda. So moving on to the professional side of the conversation. So when you marry confidence with professionalism, that's when you really begin to gain respect. So you automatically get respect from your title, but when you really gain respect is when you're both confident and professional. So let's talk about professionalism. So what is your definition of a true professional? And Everett, you can go first. Uh, something that my manager always was for me that I always emulated for my team was being their word. And like, it's, it's such small things sometimes too. Um, like telling your team you're going to do a raffle at the next team meeting and then you just don't. And it's not because you didn't want to, it's because you forgot. But just simple things like that, keeping your word, like sending their fast start prizes on time, um, communicating everything with them, taking responsibility for when you don't. And like just being your word is really important because that's how you gain trust. And like, if you break that really early on, and a rep doesn't really trust you, they're not going to trust that what you are asking of them to do is in their best interest. So, you know, keeping your word is going to keep that trust, keep that relationship. And I think like professionalism goes as deep as like it really connects those two. Yeah, that's a really great point. So just make sure, because it is true. It's not that you intentionally are not keeping your word. It's that you forget. And for those of you that are first year grant managers, you'll find that the, the, Arrows fly left and right during your first summer, so it's easy to forget things. So number one, don't overpromise. You don't need to, to promise the sun. Like you can, you can give them small things. You don't need to promise a free dinner or whatever. You can, again, small things. Then if you do promise something, write it down for yourself on a place where you will see it all the time. For example, I'm going to own up to it. I have yet to send out the one minute manager books that I promised and it's in my calendar for tomorrow to send them out because I know that I promised that I would give them to three people. Um, so I'm owning up to that. 
But if, it can, if I get busy and I work nine to five, you guys are gonna get busy, I promise you. Okay, um, Colton. Yeah, so first of all, that was all awesome. Like I think that's all like embodies professionalism, just like following through um, in general. Um, one of the things that I'll discuss that a lot of people have kind of asked me about recently is how you balance being somebody's manager and being their friend. Um, and, and there's a lot of different ways to approach it. And if you've ever heard like separating the two and where you're only being someone's manager, that's one way to look at it, right? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Um, on the other hand, I don't know if it's the best idea to be just somebody's friend and not have the manager part of the relationship, right? What I look at as being the middle ground is just always remembering to come from a place of what is in the best interest of them, right? And if you can always do what is going to genuinely help and benefit the rep, um, then there's never going to be any issues. Um, and so I think in, in my office, for sure, it's I really care about everybody on our team to the point where I consider them my friends, right? And I think it helps that as a branch, like as a lot of us are college students, right, or we're around that age, I think it's totally natural to be friendly and friends with our reps. Um, now, at the same time, the, the limitation there is, um, especially during the summer, we want to keep it, the relationship professional enough where you're not going out and partying with reps. Um, you're not their best friend throughout the summer, right? But you're somebody that they can go to with like serious things and things that come up in their life, and you want to be that resource and outlet for them. Um, and that's like one of the things I loved so much about the summer is that many of the reps on our team, we continued to talk during the school year and now, and they're like actual friends of mine, right? And there was nothing wrong with that. Um, so again, like it's still super important to always be professional, right? Be mature, be appropriate, um, but never feel bad or guilty about like also having a personal relationship, right? Cause that's something that's really important is having like a lot of trust um, so that they look at you as not only your, their manager, their friend, but also as a role model too. Yeah. And with that, Colton, I think that's a great point. And it's one that we, it's debated a lot, right? You hear some people say you're the manager, you're not their friend. Other people say, you know, you're a friendly manager. Other people say, keep the mystique. At the end of the day, I think you should go with what feels best for you. But it is important that if you're going to go down the route that Colton's describing, where you are, where you are friends, you're also their manager, that you define what that friendship looks like. Because I have friends, but I have friends that are my friends that I see at Vector conferences. I also have friends that I go out to nightclubs with. The way that I act with those two groups is usually pretty different, um, at least for the most part. So make sure that you define what that friendship is going to look like and recognizing that if there is at any point when you're describing that friendship that where you are like questioning, is this crossing a boundary? don't go there. If you're questioning if it's crossing a boundary, it is crossing a boundary. So just don't go there. But it does, it is important to define that for, for yourself because I think I was friends with my, with my reps too, but I also wouldn't invite them to come back to my apartment and crack open a beer with me at the end of the day. So it just, it's just different. Um, so let's going into, we have to hear from Miranda. So bring up uh, Miranda. Here you go. <laughs> okay, um, kind of, <laughs> um, kind of piggybacking off of that a little bit. Um, and what we were talking about with the previous question, recognize that with your title being a manager, you innately deserve respect. And so I have this note from Shelby and I's call. It says you don't have to show the cool side of you because the job is already fun. And that was a huge eye opener for me. Um, and as far as professionalism goes, just the way you show up the way you dress and don't leave somebody waiting for you. Don't show up to an interview 30 minutes before it's supposed to start. Don't show up to training an hour before it's supposed to start. You need to be there. You need to be the first one there. Never ever let a rep beat you to the office. Um, another big thing is gratitude. I know Colton mentioned this earlier, but that was definitely one of the biggest things I learned is just always coming from a place of gratitude and don't be afraid to admit when you're wrong because they'll have way more respect for you if you do admit when you're wrong instead of just balls to the wall all the time. Just show them you're an actual human being and that you make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And then show them how you can make it up to them and be better moving forward. Well, then my final thing for this one is 
I don't know if this is like a division or region thing. I'm sure you guys probably heard of this, but there's a saying, never broke, never tired, never hungry. So never let your reps see like you may be dying on the inside because you got four hours of sleep, but you better show up to that office so energized. Same thing. You never want to complain about money. You never want to complain about how hungry you are. You are never let them see that you're broke, tired or hungry. So that would be my biggest thing for that. Yeah, that's valuable. So quick little note off of that. What needs to happen? You need to get proper sleep. You need to stock your mini fridge with food and you need to set yourself up for success from a financial standpoint. You might be a little bit broke in the beginning because you're getting things rolling, but just don't spend money on stupid stuff. You can go back to the Adam stock call that we had in January to clarify. Um, I do want to reiterate what Miranda just said about you don't have to show your cool side. The job is already cool. I think that's a really great point. I forgot that I even said that to you. So I'm glad that you brought that up. It was a nugget for me. Um, but it's also really important to realize that you like, don't try to make your reps like you just be a good person, be a good manager and they will like you like help them make money, help them gain experience, help them do well at the job and they will like you. My first, my first manager, like the, the guy who trained me, it was his very first training and he was kind of weird. He's not in the business anymore, so I feel okay saying it. He was a little bit weird, but he poured into me. He cared about me. He always answered my PDI calls. So I liked him. I was like, he's different. If I was not in Vector, I don't know if we'd be in the same circle of friends, but he really cares about me. So I've got no reason not to like him. So I think that's one of the areas that young branch managers tend to get screwed up in is they want their reps to like them. They will like you if you help them do the job. That's it. It's as simple as that. All right, cool. Okay. So next question, this is the question that I've gotten a lot at roundtables, and this is for everybody here, um, for Colton, Everett, and Miranda. How do you address someone questioning your age or your authority? So Colton, if you want to go first. Yeah, I mean, that, that's something that I think will prob that probably happens all the time to branches, right? Because we're running a business and doing something really cool at a super young age. Um, I always like to turn that into the biggest positive ever, right? I think what we get to do as 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds, whatever, is so freaking awesome. And I just make sure that the person in question kind of understands that that's how I feel, right? And we can all do that, which is awesome. Um, and then like, if you're, if you can show and like, if they know how hard you work, then there won't be a, a question of professionalism, right? Because like, in our case, like our reps know that like, I'm always the first and last one at the office, you know, and we're in a co-working space with like 60 other people here, like in other businesses. I'm always the first one and last one in the office out of them too. So like if someone's ever questioning professionals, just remind them of like what you do, you know? Um, and then the other thing is just whenever in question, like if you're wondering how can I do something that like makes me professional, right? Just look at what your mentors would do, right? So in my case, it's like, what would Danny do? Like he would do this, right? And so for me, that's like, oh, I know that Danny always goes out of his way to help reps and help people in general, right? So for me, that's like, oh, this, does this person need a ride? Is that why they might not show up to training? Okay, I'm gonna get up super early, drive all the way 20 minutes to their town and make sure they get to the office with me for training, right? It's doing things that go out of your way to help others, right? It's saying hi to the janitors, making relationships with people in your, in your building. Um, so all those little things and just like learning from your mentors and trying to implement them and, and just remember that you're doing something that's like really cool and special and nobody can take that away from you. Yeah, definitely. Everett? So for questioning your age, that's a question that I kind of like to get now because I just kind of look at people funny for a second. Like not like in a mean way at all. I just kind of let them sit on the question they asked. And then they always say something after. And it doesn't really matter what they say after, but then you have the opportunity to just not actually say anything. Um, sometimes people ask that question just because they aren't sure at all and they really want to know. And you can just sit back and they won't say anything. They'll just continue and we get off of it. So sometimes you can just get away without saying anything at all. Um, with going off and going from that, I also will just let them know immediately, like, yeah, I'm 20, but I'm a business owner. And uh I'm your boss. <laughs> yeah, like I'm a business owner and that you're an employee 
or a 1099, whatever you want to say, but you're a sales rep. Like if they question your authority, it's like, it doesn't make sense to me. So I just don't really give them the reaction they're looking for. I think that's kind of a key to it. Um, with creating a professional environment, maintaining it. I like a lot of what Colton said, like thinking about like being the first one, last one in and out of the office every day and uh, building relationships with people that are in your building is actually really cool. I had um, an accountant on my floor next to me and his wife had Cutco for 40 years and he brought him over during training one time. And during the break, I just sharpened them in the training class, like watched and they, it was a really cool experience for them because it was like the third or fourth week of May and it was one of my first training groups. So it was cool for them to see and building relationships can go a long way with people in your building. They can also be leads for when you start selling personally. That too. He ended up buying like 500, 500 bucks during SE2. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I want to just quickly jump off of both of what Colton and Everett said, and then I want, want to let Miranda give her a response. Um, so when it comes to people questioning your age, there will be times where someone questions your age out of spite. Like they're not, it's just, it's disrespectful. Um, that's when you just kill them with kindness. Like if someone just being disrespectful to you, you kill them with kindness and I would take Colin's approach. Um, it, I mean, it just, it depends on what approach you like the most, but chances are if someone's asking your age, they're probably not asking your age because they're doubting your validity. They're probably just asking your age because they're genuinely curious. Like we are a young company. It's kind of cool. The fact that like, so like what Colton said, like it's kind of cool that you get to be a manager. Um, if someone is being snarky, you can kill them with kindness and you can also say, well, I'm old enough to be behind this desk. It's another quick, quick way of responding. Um, so Miranda, I want to hear what you would say or how you're going to handle it this year. Yeah. So I totally agree with what everyone has said. Um, and also just recognize like you are the one standing in front of them for a reason. Like your DVM would not have chosen you to run an office and the company to invest thousands of dollars in you if they didn't believe in what you were capable of. So recognize that. Um, but that was one thing I was nervous about going into the summer last year. So I actually had a couple calls with Sam Latrico about it, but you can kind of just make a game out of it. Just be like, I don't know, you'll find out at SC2. So that's just another way to keep like promoting SC2 in like a little fun way or just like a, how old do you think I am? Just kind of have fun with it. That way you're not not answering their question, but you're not answering. Um, and I know the um, gentleman had talked about how to maintain a professional environment. And with that, like little things, keep the office clean. You know, your version of cleanliness might not be the same as others. So just always keep it clean. Um, and going back to the question before I meant to say this, um, professionalism goes beyond just your office realize that we are a national company so if you do something that could affect someone four states over and also like responding to emails like when your region manager or division manager sends you an email sends you a whatsapp don't be the person they're chasing down for a response be the person to respond first be the person to submit your sales report on time it's little things like that that go such a long way and across the board just be a good person that's the most important thing yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do have two more questions, but I do want to give ample time for Q and A. Um, so I think this is a great topic. I think a lot of people probably have questions or comments or things about this topic in particular. I do want to make one quick mention. I mentioned this at one event. I don't remember which one, but if you have an office that has a bathroom in it. So, which means you are responsible for the bathroom. There are a couple things that you absolutely need to have in that bathroom. Plenty of extra toilet paper, hand soap, and a trash can. You absolutely have to have a trash can in that bathroom. A lot of times, guys, forget about that, but you need to have a trash can for a lot of different reasons. Another thing that would be nice to have that you should probably invest in is like a spray can. Just make it smell nice because this is a little TMI, but there will be people that use your bathroom to go number two and they will feel really embarrassed if there's nothing on the spray and they have to come out of your bathroom and it smells. So just make it comfortable for your people, okay? 
All right, so I want to open up for Q&A. Go ahead and just use the chat box to um, indicate that you have a question, and then I will go and unmute you. So we'll give everyone a couple minutes to ask. And if no one has a question, I'll ask another one. Okay, Christina, go ahead. Hi, everyone. So my question is that I've run training three times already, and I've always been mentioning like what year I am like studying currently. So I know like this goes along with like what age, like them asking me about my age and everything. I haven't had that problem specifically, but should I just not mention I'm like currently in college or my year of college because they technically could assume my age? I don't think so. Yeah, I'm ready to go ahead. Yeah, I'll take this one. I think that's ultimately up to you. I mean, as long it it's up to you to decide but like one little change in verbiage you could just be like I started as a student at Clemson that way they don't know whether you're still a student or not when you started and then just leave it at that but I think it's up to you Christina whatever you decide yeah I, I would say the same I think if it hasn't been a problem for you I think I think this question the reason why I brought it up for us to talk about was because I get it a lot from people but I quite frankly think it's a little bit silly because one don't worry about anything that's not a reality until it's become a reality. So for the first year branches, everyone's worrying about, you know, them being too young or being perceived as too young, but don't worry about it until it becomes a reality. And then you have a couple things in your back pocket to use to address it, but the chances are it's not going to be a problem. So if it, if it hasn't been a problem for you yet, Christina, don't worry about it. Um, yeah, I really wouldn't worry about it. Okay. Next question, Aaliyah. Where are you there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so I know you just said don't worry about things that aren't problems yet, but um, there are a lot of females on this call, so I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, I am worried about reps like flirting with me or hitting on me. Um, I will be running a branch and uh, it has happened to me. So I was in Oakland and like some a sales rep flirted with me. I don't know if that was just because I was an AM at the time and I wasn't actually the boss. Um, but if that does happen, how should I handle that? Great question. Um, Miranda, do you want, I, I have an answer for her, but do you want an answer or do you want to answer? I'd actually like you to answer on this one because you've helped me out with this a lot too. So I want to hear you. Okay. So Aaliyah, there's a couple different ways of approaching it, but the first thing is you need to define your boundaries. So what, what is flirting to you? Because for some guys, flirting can, being friendly can be confused as flirting. Like I think about some of my guy friends who are just really friendly, but it can come off as being flirty. So you need to define what your boundaries are. At what point is somebody flirting with you? And if somebody crosses that point, you need to have a plan in place. The first thing is to find your boundaries. And then when someone begins to cross them, it's a simple, it's a simple conversation. Hey, listen, I really appreciate your compliment or I really appreciate um, whatever, like you can acknowledge like, hey, I appreciate it, but we're in a professional work environment and I don't tolerate flirting. Um, I might've missed out the situation, but I felt like you might've been flirting. So um, I just don't tolerate that here. Something along those lines, now the verbiage might be a little bit different now that I'm saying it out loud, but I think it's just addressing it right away and saying, hey, I appreciate the compliment, but this is not the place for complimenting my looks. I'm your manager, let's just keep it professional. Something along those lines, and it's better to just nip it in the bud right away and just handling it with confidence and with one on, you know, um, eye contact. Does that, does that help? Yes, thank okay. you. Cool, all right, Charlie. Hi, um, so I think it was Everett talking about um, keeping your word with like contests and stuff like that. Um, and then Shelby used it to make small contests. Um, so I come with, from Scotty's office and he totally spoils us with a bunch of different crazy contests. And I was just kind of wondering what a contest looks like in a branch office because we obviously don't have the same funds that a DBM would have. I can talk about this one, and I'm sure Shelby <laughs> can definitely add on to this, and I'm sure Colton can definitely add on. Take, take it over. Um, so, peelers, 
stay cheap with peelers. Like that's my, that's my limit. Get really good at selling like the vector big pen, utopian coffee sticker. Um, look on the literature orders. Once you're listed as a branch manager, you'll be surprised some of the cool little Cutco gadgets you can get, but things like Cutco koozies, I think they cost like a dollar each and, you know, giving out some, like one of those, um, like lanyards, they're like two or three bucks. You can buy a lot of like this Cutco stuff on the lid orders and it's really, really cheap. Um, you can go to a dollar store and get little stuff and kids appreciate anything, even if it's like buying a thing of candy and giving like some kind of candy or like a gift card, have like, like my thing, my most expensive that I did was like a $20 gas card raffle. And that was for most orders um, in the past two weeks of a push. Yeah, that's great. Um, Colson and Miranda, any other suggestions? Um, just utilize the region contest because there's a lot of really good ones. I mean, just get really good at promoting those. That way you don't even have to have an expense. I totally agree with everything Everett said. Yeah, I mean, you have the ability to promote your rep. Like your reps have the ability to win a trip to, I forget where your region trip is, but you can get really good at promoting that. That's a pretty cool incentive. Um, another idea, Charlie, is um, when you have pop week, during your team meeting leading into that pop week, you get a ton of balloons and you put little uh, prizes in each balloon. So you write on a little piece of paper and your prizes could be a high five. They could be a, uh, so you can put a lot of high fives in there and then they could be a piece of candy. You go to the dollar store and you get a big thing of candy. They could be um, free water on me, like a joke, you know, and then one of them could be a $20 gift card. So that way people are really excited about popping because they know that there's one that has $20 in it, but the rest are like small, fun, silly little things. Cool. Okay, the next question is Pat. Hey guys, um, so this is kind of just to anyone really, but one thing that I heard from my manager about a month back was we were talking about me running interviews and things like that and i was just recently running training so he said that as far as female presence in our office goes i don't negatively negatively affect it in any way but i also don't positively affect it, it positively affect it in any way i'm like super neutral about it um what would be any tips on trying to positively affect the female presence in my office particularly me being a male manager and I know a lot of times, like, uh, David Madara, when he first started out, like, his entire office was just, like, a frat house. Um, and I know that a lot of male managers struggle with getting females on the teams at times. What would be um, any thoughts or opinions on trying to add to the female presence as a male manager? I'll take this one. That's okay. Um, since I am a female and I started with a male manager, um, gratitude, honestly, just feeling important is very is a big thing. So just making sure you take the time to like appreciate the females who are working hard um, and keeping an eye out because um, what Aaliyah said does happen, especially as reps. So kind of creating those boundaries. And if you see like your female reps getting hit on a lot or just in uncomfortable situations, take those males outside or have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Make, make sure they know that that's not going to be, that's not going to fly. Because if they feel uncomfortable in the environment, then they're not going to stick around and they're not going to recommend their friends. Yeah, that's so. a good point. Really, really, really good point. Um, Pat, another point to make um, is when you have sharp females, celebrate them. Like celebrate what you want to replicate. So if you want more, the good thing is that you don't negatively impact. Like your manager did not tell you negatively impact the females. You don't positively, so you take some of Miranda's advice with gratitude, making them feel listened to and, and heard. Like the, the, I hate when my fiance just doesn't listen to me. Like all I want him is to listen. Like that's what females typically want, which is to be listened to. So it's just taking the time to actually listen to them and recognizing that sometimes things aren't necessarily black and white and there's, there might be a lot of gray area that you have to sift through. Um, a great book I'd recommend reading is Men Are From, or Women Are From Venus and Men Are From Mars, or Women Are From Mars or Men Are From Venus. I, it's something, if someone can type it in the thing, they know, I don't, I forget what it's called. I think it's Women Are From Venus, Men Are From Mars, but it talks about just the difference of, 
of male and female. Um, but if you have female leaders, like what, what creates more female leaders is when you have female leaders. So if you have somebody in your office that is a rabbit and she's a female, like promote her to AM, promote her to key staff, like get her to be your right hand woman in a way. Um, have, have a female be your second person in an interview, have a female do the, uh, day two demo. If you still do that, like just balance it out, you know, don't have it be all men, have it be man and woman. And the big thing there is just to celebrate what you want to replicate. And that is a phrase that can be ap applied to everything. You want more people to call on for PDI, you celebrate those who call on for PDI. You want people to sell sets, you celebrate those who have, like have sold sets. So that kind of thing. Um, any questions on that, Pat? Does that answer your question? I think that silence is yes. Yeah, no, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, it does. And I actually um, just bought that book about three days ago because um, someone else recommended that to me. So I'm just waiting for Amazon to, Amazon to ship it to my house. But um, it's Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, um, The Classic Guide to Understanding the Opposite Sex by John Gray, spelt A-Y. Cool. That's great. That is really awesome. Well, thank you. Any further questions? We've got four minutes left here. We've got time for one or two more questions. Um, here, I've got a question because this was from Michaela Dancheco in the Facebook group. How would you go about maintaining a professional environment at Team Night Out? And Miranda Everett, Everett, you can go. I, I thought that Justin Ludwig's response on that was absolutely perfect. Like, you just want to acknowledge that they said something. And you don't want to like put it down. You just want to completely shift the conversation and just like in no way negatively talk about what they're talking about. Just shift to something different. Acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge it too. You can't just like interject something completely different. Yeah. Cool. That's a great response. One quick thing also. Sorry, Shelby. Go ahead. Did you okay. want to say something? Yeah. Um, they are always watching you. So make sure you tip well. Make sure you interact with the waitress well. Make sure you're just kind and polite. Like it's the little things like that, they're watching your every move. So don't leave like a $5 tip, leave a hefty tip and just show them like the type of person you are. It's really, really important, the little things like that as well. Yeah, 20% is the is the beneficial tip amount. So just, you know, cause $5 tip on a $10 meal could be a really beneficial tip, but yeah. 20% is, is beneficial. Um, okay, Declan, just wanted to ask what your best tips for making sure everyone feels equally included and no one feels left out. That's a good question. So what are your best tips for creating an environment of inclusion in the office so that nobody feels left out? I think one thing um, you can definitely do for that is like at team meetings, because one of the parts about team meetings is you want to give a lot of recognition to everybody. And it's not just the top sales performers, right? So I would actually, like before team meetings, I spend a good chunk of time going through the stats for the week and thinking, what can I um, what can I give recognition to this person for and this person? So even if they didn't have a big sales week, it's like, oh, this person did a lot of appointments, right? They were one of the hardest workers in the office. Or this person helped out a lot with running the phone jam or this, you know what I mean? Like you can think of something that each person on the team did to contribute and just like constantly pull recognition, even if it's not like a CPO number. Yeah, that's a great, that's great too. Another thing that you can do is you just get the general like conversation started during a team meeting, for example, because sometimes there will be people that are naturally shy that join your team. And so they will naturally close off without intending to, but that's just their personality. So doing icebreakers at the beginning of team meetings are always really valuable because it, it forces people to kind of interact with one another. Um, another thing is if you see someone sitting alone and not interacting, you go over to them and you chat with them and they say, okay, hey, have you met some of these people over here? Let's go introduce you to them. Or, hey, like, have you gotten a chance to really get to know Miranda? Let me go introduce you to her. And you sometimes have to be that shepherd for them to help them feel comfortable in your team. And I think about people that I had on my team that were so different than me and were so different than a lot of people that were on my team, but they were actually some of my favorite reps because of the fact they were so different. It was, it was a little bit challenging to getting them to get them integrated into the team, but it was also so cool because they just taught me different things that I, I didn't know. Like 
I'm not a, a video gamer, but I had a rep who was like totally a video gamer. And so again, trying to find places of, of connection was, was an interesting challenge that forced me to get outside of my box. Um, so does that answer your question, Declan? No, you're muted, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm just in my room with my roommates, so I want to try to keep myself not that way, like distracting. But thank you for all the tips, and I really appreciate all the help and all these calls. Cool. Okay, great. So we're at the 5 o'clock mark, so I appreciate all of you. Um, if you feel like you gained value from this call, there's no giveaway here because I'm still behind on the one-minute manager, as I've already admitted. There's no giveaway, but we want your peers on this call. Uh, if you've gained value from this call, I really empower you and I encourage you and I ask you to post on the Branch Impact page what some of your takeaways were because it will help your peers put this on top of their list of things not to miss or at least to make sure that they watch the recording. So thank you all so much and have a great night and I will see the Northeasters, Northeasterners this weekend. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.